Hello and welcome to ADB Insight. I'm Nisha Pillay. The fight against climate change will be won or lost in the Asia-Pacific region. And to win that fight, the region must pivot decisively towards net zero emissions. As part of that goal, organizations like the Asian Development Bank have committed to what's called a just transition. A commitment that the move away from carbon intensive economies to more renewable and sustainable ones will share the cost and benefits that no community, industry or worker is left behind. Such a transition is of course daunting, but it also offers a real opportunity for the Asia Pacific region to expand economies, to reset labour markets and to address inequalities. To discuss what a just transition could and should look like, I'm joined now by Sharon Burrow, the General Secretary of the International Trade Union Confederation and a leading voice on the rights of workers. Sharon, thanks so much for joining us on ADB Insight. So first of all, may I ask you, what does a just transition mean to you? Just transition means that we leave no one behind. We've seen many transitions in our industrial and social history, and very few of them have been just in terms of the people or the communities that they've affected. Decades ago, the union movement framed the demand for transition as a just transition. We know every sector has to transition if we're to meet the challenge of uh, net zero by 2050. We know we have to do half of that job by 2030 to even have a chance of stabilising the planet. But a just transition is really very simple in concept. For working people, it means if the transition is going to displace your job, then for older workers, it means secure pensions. For workers who are not yet retired, but very close to it, who choose to retire, you need a bridge to those pensions, an income bridge. If you're a younger worker, then you need income support, reskilling support and redeployment support. And of course, it means investment in community renewal. So are you confident then that a just transition is actually achievable? Well, it's possible. I'm absolutely confident that it's possible. Am I confident that it will be achieved? Not unless we see much more rapid, responsible leadership from governments and indeed from corporations. And it takes courage. That means that political will has to be shifted from, in some countries, denial. In other countries, it's not our responsibility. In, in some countries, in fact, it costs too much. We need to have the understanding that this is such a crisis that it threatens the very existence of humanity. For workers, for the trade unions, we have a very simple framework. We also have concurrent to the climate crisis, a massive crisis of inequality. And a broken labour market is in large part responsible for that. 60% of working people are indeed in informal work, no rights, no minimum wage, no rule of law, often unsafe, short term, precarious work. Even in the formal contracts of employment, a third of people are in very precarious work and most of them will be low paid and most will be women in both sectors of the economy. So we need to see that a just transition is really a new social contract. So a lot to unpack there, including women's rights and gender inequalities. How exactly should a just transition address the rights and opportunities of girls and women? Well, we have to have indeed a gender lens on transition full stop. If you go back to the statistics of the broken labour market, the majority of people are women and the majority of people in those precarious jobs are women, increasingly young people as well, but that includes young women. So it's still overridingly an exclusion of women. If you think about COVID-19, women lost $800 billion of income during the pandemic. That's the equivalent 
GDP of about 98 countries. If we don't have a gender um, lens on just transition, a transformative gender approach to just transition, to full employment, to rights, to social protection, to equality, then again, our world will become more divisive, more exclusionary. We have to invest in full employment. And one of those uh, areas of investment is the care economy. We can show you how we can get 575 million new jobs in the formal economy by 2030 and formalize a billion jobs, half of that uh, informal economy by 2030, but a huge bulk of it beyond the energy transition, the industrial transition in every sector is care. And COVID-19, again, this pandemic showed us the deficiencies in care. With social protection, it's part of resilience. And if you increase the investment, the UN figures show that doubling the investment in care, that's childcare, healthcare, aged care, education, you can actually get almost 300 million jobs. You're pretty much there. Do you believe there's the collective will though to make the required investments in the care economy? No, I don't. That's why we have to have this discussion globally, nationally, in local communities. This has to be part and parcel of the way in which we consider investing in job creation and labour markets for the future. We've called for a global fund for social protection. You do that, you put social protection in every country, you immediately stabilise families with a living income. You give them access to health and to education. That's investment in care and basic economies at a, at a fundamental level. You then move on to ensure there's a minimum wage, a living minimum wage. Then you again start to reduce the inequality for women. But if we then invest in those care sectors, you do two things. One is you provide good jobs in care, and there must be good jobs. There's some deficits to work out there. But if in fact you go beyond that, you lift the burden of care from women and therefore they can participate in the broader economy. And that's the biggest multiplier of economic growth anywhere. So it's a win-win. Finally, Sharon, what are you hoping to see from countries, corporations and policymakers to facilitate a just transition in the next 12 months? I'm not talking about long-term change. I'm talking about immediate action. It will, of course, continue through the medium to long term. But if you take the steel sector, for example, we've already shown with the Swedish company SSAB Steel in partnership with the unions, you can produce carbon neutral steel. Now, there are more jobs in the hydrocarbon end of that than we will lose in other sectors. That's a good news story. We've shown if you invest in mass transit in order to get cars off the road, choking our cities with pollution and the health impacts of that, you can create jobs, not just in terms of the, the drivers and the maintenance workers, but manufacturing. For renewable energy, for every 10 jobs in renewable energy, there are five to 10 in manufacturing. There's a further 30 to 35 in other economic services if they're good quality jobs with just wages. And if you invest in social protection and care, then that's an immediate choice that in fact governments, international agencies, the uh, uh, financial institutions, the development banks inclusive can do right now. Sharon Burrow, thank you so much for sharing those strongly held views and very clear analysis with us today. Thank you, Nisha. Indeed, thank you to everybody who's joined us for this episode of ADB Insight. I'm Nisha Pillay. Until I see you again, goodbye.